Hi, my name is Casey, and I'm super excited to kick off another call in the series for the We Think Twice community called Ask the Expert. We are delighted to invite Dr. Ramos with us to discuss sexually transmitted infections and sexual health. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Vincent Ramos. It's wonderful to be here. Casey, thanks so much for, uh, for being here with me. Thank you. And next up, we'll have... Logan, start us off with our first question. Hi, my name is Logan. It's nice to meet you. For our first question, I'd like to ask, what is the difference between STDs and STIs? Hi, Logan. That's uh, uh, a great question. And thank you so much for asking. So to be honest, uh, there really isn't much of a difference. There, there is a technical difference. But in our everyday lives, there's probably not a, a real distinction between STDs and STIs. And STI is actually, in, its, in a technical way, it's a virus, a bacteria, a fungus, or a parasite that can infect a person's body primarily through sex. Um, an STD is when a sexually transmitted infection, when it causes symptoms and illness or damages the body. Most often, um, STIs become STDs when they become diagnosed. Thank you. Our next question is from Maya. Hi. My name is Maya. Um, my question is, can you get an STI without having sexual intercourse, like from oral sex or a toilet seat? Hi, Maya. That's a terrific question. It's actually one that many young people ask me. And so uh, the answer is yes, you can get an STI without having vaginal, oral, anal uh, intercourse or sex. Uh, one of the ways that you can get an STI without having sex is from kissing, from genital skin to skin contact, and also for coming into contact with things like bodily fluids that are infected with an STI, uh, blood, uh, also sexual fluids, and even things like sharing sex toys. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Ramos. My next question is, what is the best method to prevent getting an STI or getting pregnant? Is abstinence the only way? Casey, thank you for uh, that question. Uh, again, that's a really great question and one that often gets asked. So the best way for adolescents and young people to avoid uh, getting an STI or having an unplanned pregnancy uh, is really from abstaining from what I call too early or premature sex. And so you might be wondering, what do I mean by too early or premature? It, it really means that a young person having sex before they're ready or prepared socially, emotionally, or physically. And part of being prepared is really having an effective and clear plan for protecting yourself. And so one, you're gonna to want to wait until you're ready. And so that certainly is uh, probably the best way of avoiding an STI or unplanned pregnancy, including HIV. But if you do decide to become sexually active, then it's gonna be important that you have a clear plan. And a clear plan means you and your partner getting tested for STIs, making sure that neither one of you has an undiagnosed STI. It means using effective contraception, and there are different contraceptive methods, particularly what we call long-acting reversible contraception, that really is effective at pre preventing an unplanned pregnancy. Receiving sexual health vaccines, there are vaccines for hepatitis uh, A, for hepatitis B, for HPV, those are really great uh, for preventing some of the adverse uh, illnesses that are associated with those viruses. And then also using condoms correctly and consistently. And those two pieces are important, knowing what the, the right steps are for using condoms, and then also using condoms for each sex act uh, every time you have sex. Thank you for that insight, Dr. Ramos. Next up, we have Joshua. Thanks, Casey. It's nice, nice to meet you, Dr. Ramos. Hi, my Josh. name is Joshua, and my question for you is, how do you know if you're ready to have sex? So Joshua, that's such a great question. I think a lot of young people often are thinking about that uh, question. And so here are a couple of things to keep in mind. So part of what I was sharing a little while ago about uh, you know, having a clear and effective plan and so you're ready to have sex when you've thought about the social, the emotional, the physical implications of being sexually active at this time in your life. If you've thought those things through and you feel prepared with an effective and clear plan, then chances are that uh, you're more ready to become sexually active. The truth is most young people in the US 
uh, have their first sexual intercourse around the age of 17. And so that's the average. So, you know, some are older, some are younger, but I think that it's important that there is no one specific time. Uh, my general guidance would be that uh, more young people are waiting today than in the past. And the truth is that having a plan that is clear and effective is gonna really help to prevent some of the negative outcomes that we sometimes see when someone has uh, sex prematurely, uh, also including adolescents and young adults. Thanks, Dr. Ramos. Next question will be from Maya. My next question is, is it possible to have an STI and not know it? How often should you get tested? So Maya, that's a great question. I think that, uh, boy, is that one important. One of the reasons why we have so many uh, STIs that continue to be transmitted to other folks is because too often STIs go undiagnosed. And the reason for that is that they may be asymptomatic. You may not have any symptoms of having that STI. And so if you don't know, there's no way that you would be aware that in fact you're passing it to someone else. The sort of best way of knowing whether or not you have an STI is by having uh, a test, yes. by see, speaking with your healthcare provider and actually getting tested for a sexually transmitted infection. I think that, um, you know, my guidance would be that as part of your routine annual physical wellness visit, that it should be part, sexual health should be part of your visit. And certainly if you are uh, sexually active and if you are uh, starting a relationship with a new partner, I would strongly recommend that both partners be tested for sexually transmitted infections. And then again, you think about having a clear plan. There are lots of options. Uh, some, of I've, some of them I've mentioned from vaccines to using uh, long acting reversible contraception to abstaining, to using correct and consistent condoms. And there's something that I actually didn't mention that I should have. And so forgive me guys for not mentioning this, but you know, too many uh, young people in our country actually have uh, been negatively impacted by HIV. The good news is, is that we have an HIV prevention pill. It's called PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. And it is very, very effective for young people that may be at risk of acquiring HIV uh, from blocking the chances that they will become infected. And this is really critical for young uh, you know, men of color, particularly young MSM of color, and for any young person that is living uh, in a community and dating an individual who uh, you know, may be HIV positive and um, you know, maybe um, you know, not what we call virally suppressed, or if you're living in a community where there's a high prevalence, there's a lot of HIV in the community, it's probably a good idea to talk to a healthcare provider about PrEP. Hi, my next question is, what are the most common STIs among the youth? That's a great question, Logan. So the most common STIs among youth are, um, I'm gonna sort of describe them in terms of new infections. And so the top three are one, uh, human papillomavirus, HPV. The second is chlamydia and the third is trichomoniasis. I think that uh, there are some other common STIs like genital herpes and gonorrhea. And I think what's really important when we think about youth ages 15 to 24, uh, young people in that age group represent about half of all of the annual STIs in a given year. And so this is really striking because that same age group only represents one in four people that are currently sexually active. And so uh, what you can see is that that young group of 15 to 24 that is sexually active has a disproportionate burden of uh, half of those STIs in a, in, a, in a given calendar period. Thank you. Our next question is from Joshua. Thanks, Logan. My next question for you is, do male or female youth have a higher chance of getting an STI? Joshua, great question. So overall, uh, female youth have a larger proportion of all estimated STIs, and female youth are more likely to currently have an STI. Uh, female youth account for roughly 57% of the estimated incident and 62% of estimated prevalence of STI cases among 15 to 24 year olds. It is important that um, there are some STIs that are estimated to be more common among female youth, and this includes chlamydia, gonorrhea, general herpes, and HPV. But there are some STIs that are more common among male youth. And so for men, uh, that would be syphilis and HIV. And one group that I particularly want to identify as being an important one for STI prevention are young men who have sex with men 
who have uh, some uh, unique STI and HIV prevention needs. You know, STIs and HIV disproportionately impact young MSM, and it's going to be important that young MSM be routinely offered STI testing and screening, and also HIV prevention opportunities such as PrEP, which I mentioned earlier. Well, thanks for your answer. Thank you. And I'll allow um, Casey to ask the next question. For my last question, do you have STIs for the rest of your life or can they be cured? If some can be cured, can you give examples of which ones can be and which ones cannot? So Casey, what a great question. And so uh, the answer is yes, STIs for the most part can be cured. Uh, it's not necessarily the case that you're going to have them for the rest of your life, but there are some that actually cannot be cured. And so, um, you know, the ones that cannot be cured, they can be managed with effective treatment. But some examples of curable STIs include chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, and trichomoniasis. However, uh, there are some strains, for example, even among uh, some of the curable STIs, like uh, sort of strains of gonorrhea that have been resistant and increasingly resistant to some of our treatments or antibiotics. And so they become harder to treat. Right now, about half of the cases of gonorrhea in the US are what we call multi-resistant, which means that they're harder to treat. So it's important to keep in mind that while these may be curable, uh, sometimes uh, the treatment for STIs can actually be more challenging and more complicated. There are some examples of STIs that are incurable. This includes herpes, uh, this includes HIV. Uh, there are medications that can be used to help manage these STIs that are not curable. Uh, they are actually quite effective at the management of uh, the STI, but they won't treat them uh, in, in, from the point of view of them being cured. They will only manage them. Thank you, Dr. Robbins. And I'll be passing the mic on to Maya. Hi, my last question is, if you don't feel comfortable talking to your parents or doctor about sexual health, who can you turn to? Where can you find reliable resources regarding sexual health? So Maya, that's a great question. And so I want to maybe see if I can answer that in a slightly different way. And so first and foremost, uh, I think what's important is that young people have uh, someone who is an adult, uh, responsible, uh, well-informed someone who they can talk to, who they trust, who will be able to provide them with medically accurate information. I do wanna share that there is so much data, and this may seem kind of weird or strange, but there's tons of data that shows that young people across our country, that they actually wanna hear from their parents about these important issues, including their sexual health. The problem is that too often, uh, young people may be afraid that if they ask their parents questions about these issues, that somehow their parents will react poorly. Or it may be that despite parents loving and really wanting what's best for their adolescent children, they don't always feel so prepared to have a response. And so I think part of what I'm saying is that I think that we need to encourage young people and parents to have uh, open discussions, to have um, you know, the ability to hear and to know how to identify resources. One of the best resources that a young person uh, can actually seek out, and this can be done either independently or with their parent, is really talking to a healthcare provider. In this case, it could be a doctor, it could be a nurse, it could be a physician assistant, it could be a nurse practitioner, somebody who is trained specifically in sexual health, whether it be a school-based clinic or a primary care provider that will uh, be well positioned to answer those questions and provide the technical and the accurate medically uh, sort of relevant information that will help the young person to make a decision. There are, are also important websites that young people can check out on their own. The thing that's tricky here is that you've got to make sure that the website that you're using actually has medically accurate information, that it's trustworthy, and that what you're seeing and reading on that site actually gives you information that's useful. Some of the best sites in my view, there's an, a terrific organization that's called The Power to Decide. They have um, sort of a, a, a program that's called The Bedsider, bedsider.org. Boy, does it have terrific information uh, about a range of things. There's also a great program that Planned Parenthood has, which is called the Chat Text Program. What I like about that program is that you can actually send a text uh, over chat text and a real person will respond to you and answer your question. And I like sometimes sending a question and seeing what the answer is. 
And not only will they respond to you, but they'll also give you the next uh, sort of important step. So if you're worried about an unplanned pregnancy or you think you might have an STI, or you just have a general question, they'll kind of tell you what the next thing that you should do is and give you concrete guidance. There's also some trustworthy resources that are, for example, hiv.gov, the Centers for Disease Control. There are really important websites that provide information. Uh, in my message, I hope what's coming across is that you just wanna make sure that you're using a trusted resource. Your parent, an adult, primary adult caregiver who uh, you can talk to openly, healthcare providers. I'm a nurse, I'm a nurse practitioner, and I actually care for young people living with HIV, and I treat a lot of STIs in young people. I think nurses are terrific people to talk to because usually uh, kind of the nursing philosophy is very holistic, and we're good listeners, and we like to actually be helpful, and we're often seen as being very trustworthy. Thank you. Our next question will be from Joshua. Thanks, Maya. And for our last and final question, I'd like to ask, what are three things about sexual health all teens should know? Boy, Joshua, that's a great question. It's a hard one too, because I've got to get it into three things, the three most important things that I think uh, teens should know. So I think what I would want all teens to know first and foremost is that the best way for adolescents to really uh, prevent getting an STI, HIV, or an unplanned pregnancy is really to abstain from too early or premature sex. You know, being ready for sex means uh, thinking through the social, the emotional, the physical implications of being sexually active at this time in your life. So you wanna make sure that you're ready for that. And as I've mentioned, having a clear, effective plan of how you're gonna protect yourself uh, will really help you to think through whether or not uh, you're ready as a young person. The second thing is that if you do decide to have sex and many young people, uh, on average around the age of 17, do decide that they're going to become sexually active. They're gonna have their first sexual experience. It's really important that that clear and effective plan that you think about getting tested for STIs, that you and your partner think about that, that you uh, really become very knowledgeable and seek out effective contraception, particularly long acting reversible contraception, that you're up to date on sexual health vaccines, as I've mentioned, Hep B, a Hep A, HPV vaccine, that you have some education about correct and consistent condom use, that you know the simple steps of using a condom correctly and every time, and that if uh, you are someone who has concerns about HIV, I mentioned earlier living in a community where there's a lot of HIV, it's quite prevalent, or having a partner who's HIV positive, or being a member of a group, uh, for example, a young man who has sex with other men, that could potentially have an elevated risk of acquiring HIV, that you really uh, learn and seek out guidance from a healthcare provider about PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis, or what is commonly known as the HIV prevention pill. The last thing I wanna share that I think is probably the most important is that if you do have questions, if you need specific guidance about sexual health, make sure you access a trusted resource, make sure that you try to think about an adult primary caregiver in your life who you trust. For a lot of us, that could be our parent, who we can open the conversation and say, hey, I need some help. Talk to your healthcare providers. I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, that healthcare providers, I would say particularly nurses, I'm a nurse practitioner. I love talking to young people and do that every single day about these issues and find that uh, you know, healthcare providers are a great resource for getting medically accurate information. Know which sexual uh, health organizations are available in your community and use resources online that actually are reliable and trustworthy. And I've mentioned a couple like The Bedsider, certainly Chat Text at Planned Parenthood, HIV.gov, uh, CDC. There's a number and those are just a few, but I wanted to identify some concrete ones. Thanks, Dr. Ramos. Thank you, Josh. That wraps up our Ask the Expert session. This has been an informative discussion and we wanna thank you, Dr. Ramos, for taking the time to answer our questions. Also, thanks to the We Think Twice community for listening in. Stay tuned for the next Ask the Expert event.